Hello everyone. So welcome to the latest lecture session on uh, the course title Environmental Remediation of Contaminated Sites, right? So this being the first lecture session, I am sure uh, the students out there who are looking for different courses are at to decide upon which courses to enroll in and which courses not to enroll in, right? So obviously it depends upon uh, the match in interest and such. So to help or aid in you guys coming to such a decision, I am going to have the first two lecture sessions to be introductory sessions, right? And I will introduce, let us say, a case study uh, which will demonstrate the relevant aspects we are going to discuss throughout the course, right? And then in the second session, I am going to talk in detail about the relevant aspects we are going to cover. Again, this uh, course is going to be a relatively technically challenging course, right? And you will have a lot of uh, quantitative content to look at. And at the end of this particular course, you should be able to both qualitatively and quantitatively analyze and you know come up with the relevant recommendation, let us say for uh, remediating a particular contaminated site, right. So obviously again, what are we talking about here? Uh, as the name indicates or as the course title indicates, right, it is environmental remediation of contaminated sites. It is site slightly self-explanatory, right. So here we have a contaminated site, let us say, as in there has been a release or spill of uh, a contaminant or a toxic compound or a carcinogen right into the environment be it either into the air or land uh, or soil or groundwater right. So in this case what actions do you need to take if you need to take a, any action right. First obviously you need to analyze let us say whether any action is required or not right. For that obviously what do we need to do? We need to conduct risk assessment I guess right. So based on that you are going to move on to look at uh, remediating the contaminated sites. So you are going to look at different options and then we need to come up with the relevant recommendation here, right? So let us look at briefly what we are talking about. So for example, let us say I am going to uh, take the example of let us say was contaminated with chromium, right? Uh, we have a contaminated site uh, near Ghaziabad, I believe, right? And there uh, we have an industrial estate, right? And this is not uncommon, right? Uh, India being, you know, or you know, slowly transitioning from an agricultural or fuel economy, let us say, uh, not a fuel, let us say, an agricultural economy towards an industrialized uh, or industrial economy, right? We have more and more of these industrial clusters within uh, what do we say proximity of uh, human clusters, right? Or densely populated areas too. So in general, let us say uh, the case here is that or the background here is that we have, uh, we have a lot of such industries in this uh, particular place, Ghaziabad, right? And they were, what do we say, involved with, uh, what do we say, uh, ball bearings or such and the major industry there was involved with what do we say production of fans let us say, right. And in this uh, what do we say context uh, looks like uh, considerable uh, heavy metals were released into the uh, subsurface, right. And obviously I guess this was the case when uh, what do we say the population density was relatively less and also the regulations and more importantly the enforcement too was not stringent, right. But obviously with increasing population density, right, and also with increasing awareness, let us say, and also maybe due to what do we say greater contamination at that particular site, uh, there was an outcry I believe around a decade ago, right. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the relevant regulatory agencies uh, looked at the relevant aspects and they saw that or noticed that uh, heavy metal concentrations were remarkably high, specifically for chromium, right. This can also be a carcinogen to my knowledge, right. Yes, so we have this particular uh, contaminated uh, site here, right? And what is it contaminated with? It is with contaminated with chromium. So again, uh, legal battles and so on and so forth. And finally, I believe the court uh, asked the uh, major industry out there, right? Uh, or laid the blame on the major industry or the largest industry out there and asked them to uh, remediate the site and uh, go ahead with its particular uh, uh, remediation, I guess, right? So in that context, obviously, what needs to be done or how do we need to go about it, let us say, right? Let us look at what needs to be done and what was done and maybe, you know, compare uh, what do we say the two uh, scenarios out there, right? So obviously, let us say you have a contaminated site, right? So there has been a spill or release of a toxic or a carcinogenic compound, right? So in this context though, before I start remediating the, uh, try to remediate the particular site which obviously involves uh, resources, time and money, right? I need to first uh, quantitatively assess if this particular remediation is necessary, right? 
So, how do I go about that? I need to come up with risk assessment I guess, right. I need to first conduct risk assessment as in let us say uh, a particular manager or let us say the relevant officer out there cannot take a management decision based on let us say saying that okay the risk is high, low or not so low because they are subject to terms right. So, obviously, he needs to come up with or he needs to have what do we say numbers at his disposal that will obviously you know uh, provide greater clarity to him about the need for what do we say remediation and the type of remediation that is required right. For example, there are different pathways as in is it the soil that is contaminated or is it the ground water that is contaminated or the surface water that is contaminated and if so to what extent are these different pathways contaminated and so on and then what is the risk associated with what do we say ingesting this ground water or what do we say coming in contact with the soil through you know in the parks and such let us say what are the risks associated with what do we say ingesting the soil or what do we say uh, ingesting the water or coming in contact with the soil or so on right. So, once you identify the risks associated or L2 risks associated with each of these pathways right you can you as in the manager can come up with choosing what do we say uh, the best options out there depending upon the limited resources right. Obviously, in the ideal case scenario you are going to have unlimited resources, but that is never going to be the case. So, with the limited chunk of uh, uh, money out there let us say or resources you are going to decide let us say what is more feasible right and what is more important and again you need to look at the timelines too right. So, in that context obviously risk assessment is going to help you pin down the relevant aspects right and obviously cut out let us say uh, any ambivalence on the part of the particular uh, industry or such though right as in let us say the industry personal code in general obviously right uh, not obviously anyway in general uh, they try to uh, uh, you know shirk from their responsibilities right usually it is the polluter pays principle yes. So, again uh, first you are going to conduct risk assessment right and in this context you are going to come up with quantifiable risks right quantifiable risks right and then you are going to uh, move further. So, once I identify the uh, contaminants or you know hazardous compounds and then quantify the relevant risks and the pathways right I am going to choose the remedial options. So, in general let us say I am going to look at remedial alternatives let us say right and then I am going to look at different aspects right as in costs again feasibility right and what do we say the ease of uh, getting these options onto the ground let us say or you know actually uh, constructing them and implementing them operation and maintenance costs again obviously right and obviously the most important aspects the level of attenuation to which these particular remedial measures or the level of attenuation that can be brought about by these remedial alternatives or measures. So, based on that let us say they are going to choose or we are going to choose one particular alternative right right and go forth with that and obviously look at monitoring from time to time right. So, in this course uh, what aspects are we going to cover in detail certainly risk assessment right and then in a detailed analysis of what are the different remedial alternatives out there as in let us say we are going to look at two primary aspects as in contaminated soil or sediments right and contaminated ground water let us see. So, we are going to look at different cases right uh, of uh, contamination of soils and sediments in one particular section in the second half of the course and in the first half of the course we are going to discuss uh, how do we remediate different scenarios of uh, contaminated ground water right. So, there are aspects let us say like uh, pumping and treating right we are going to discuss in the uh, these in detail in the second session, but you know I am just going to introduce the topics out here and then PRBs permeable reactive barriers right. For example, here we have solidification and stabilization right so on and so forth right. We are going to uh, what do we say uh, analyze and understand each of these treatment options in great detail right. So, uh, before I go further we are still talking about this particular uh, what do we say uh, uh, chromium contaminated site. So, looks like it was spread over 3 square kilometers let us say and here let us say the source of contamination is out here right. Let us say this is the plan view this is the plan view and let us say this is the source of contamination out here and let us say this is the ground water flow direction here right. 
And so first obviously what studies do we need to conduct here? We need to get an idea about the groundwater flow and the uh, uh, aquifer characteristics and so on. So once that was done, you know, an estimate about or a model about what do we say the contaminated plume, right? This is the boundary of this particular contaminated plume for a particular concentration needs to be uh, what is estimated or obviously you know come up with based on you know putting in some monitoring wells. So obviously there were a lot of uh, boring uh, wells you know that people dug in or you know already have uh, right uh, for drinking water and so on or for sourcing drinking water pardon me and thus you know they were able to come up with the relevant uh, plume though. So once they had that particular aspect though they you know put in uh, what do we say pump and treat you know option in place right. So they had uh, put up a pump and they pump it out, right? Take it to a water treatment plant out there, right? Take it to a water treatment plant and then they could have re-injected it again. They could have re-injected it, but they did not re-inject it because they were not able to treat the water to the levels that uh, they uh, uh, wanted to, let's say, for the groundwater standards. So what did they do? I guess this being India, they. Uh, I guess more or less end up uh, what do we say uh, supplying it to uh, supplying it for irrigation well that I would say is not a great alternative let us say right. But again I guess considering the circumstances you know uh, and the options that is what they have been up to let us say. So they are you know uh, so this water rather than being re-injecting they are now what do we say supplying it for uh, what do we say uh, uh, parks and such in the vicinity so that they can water the lands and so on right. So here the principle was I believe uh, chromium 6 is the oxidation state at which it, it was uh, what do we say it is uh, existing in ground water right and I think chromium 6 is uh, pretty toxic the oxidation state chromium in its oxidation state of 6. So they had to reduce it to chromium 3 and that is what they were doing in the uh, wastewater uh, or this ground water treatment plant first reducing chromium 6 to chromium 3 right with the reducing agent I think they were using sulphite to reduce this particular uh, what do we say uh, chromium and then chromium 3 usually precipitates out it precipitates out right. So then they are removing chromium 3 from that particular water. So obviously here kinetics and equilibrium these are the aspects that are involved here right as in how fast uh, the particular reaction of uh, chromium 6 with uh, sulphide goes through right what are the stoichiometries involved and so on. And then obviously you know it is again uh, with respect to precipitation again even though you are going to precipitate chromium th uh, 3 out you are still going to have uh, some chromium 3 in the solution because it is an equilibrium you are never going to remove it entirely right. So again after that removal what are they going to do you know they are going to you know send this water out for uh, what do we say irrigating the parks right. While chromium 3 they are sending to it to a TSDF or hazardous waste landfill let us say hazardous waste landfill. So this is a treatment storage and disposal facility TSDF treatment storage and disposal facility. So typically you have one such uh, TSDF per state in general that is how it works in the Indian context right. And this was one way that they were tre uh, treating the contaminated groundwater. And all this time obviously the uh, what is the residents still need to be able to access drinking water right. So what are the uh, relevant companies uh, you know what is the relevant company up to. So they are pr now providing uh, tankers in particular uh, what do we say to the whole locality right uh, as an alternative to, uh, for uh, drinking water right. And also other than this particular aspect of reduction and removal by precipitation right what have they also been looking at so looks like a few other people from a different institute I believe IIT Madras they isolated a few strains of uh, bacteria let us say from uh, different locations where the concentrations of chromium were pretty high. So uh, chromium 6 were pretty high so this particular uh, what do we say microbes or such let us say you know are used to let us say I am trying to use layman's terms let us say are uh, used to very, very high uh, what we say chromium 6 uh, concentrations. So again it is a principle of survival of the fittest. So those microbes that were isolated from those particular areas where chromium 6 concentration was very high let us say showed a tendency to reduce chromium 6 to chromium 3. Again why would microbes do that 
again microbes want to uh, you know survive too right so they were trying to use it as a source of a uh, particular uh, source of energy right again as we know microbes either in wastewater treatment what is the principle here you know redox reactions they act as catalysts more or less right so here again uh, looks like uh, those particular microbes that were thriving in those uh, localities where chromium 6 concentration was high what we say uh, showed a remarkable ability to reduce chromium 6 to chromium 3 right and so these strains were again introduced in the groundwater here right so what's happening out there in the groundwater chromium 6 which is more soluble so chromium oxidation state 6 is more soluble chromium 3 can precipitate out right precipitate out so this is more soluble this is insoluble right so they were trying to what do we say have what do we if i can say uh, introduce these microbes or colonies into uh, the groundwater out there right in that locality uh, from time to time and they did observe considerable levels of removal uh, from chromium 6 to chromium 3 which is the more insoluble form I guess right and you know uh, by this again they are trying to reduce the concentration of groundwater uh, not groundwater pardon me uh, concentration of this carcinogen chromium in groundwater right so again it was a twofold uh, what do we say uh, or a two pronged attack on the relevant aspect I guess right here again you can say it is uh, natural attenuation or you know it is not natural but maybe engineered attenuation I guess uh, attenuation by uh, microbes let us say and such right and one aspect I guess that could have been improved upon as we were talking about was uh, choosing the location of these uh, pumping valves as in let us say uh, as we are going to discuss later you know to be able to capture the width of the plume and the total volume of the particular plume based on aquifer characteristics and let us say groundwater flow direction right you have what do we say based on Havendal et al's uh, work with respect to the relevant modeling particular locations where you need to place these uh, what do we say pumps or extraction wells right so here let us say to my knowledge uh, that was not done uh, but maybe I might be mistaken but to my knowledge that data that I have collected indicated that such an analysis was not done. So if you are able to let us say place these wells according to the relevant uh, what do we say scientific estimates you know the chances of uh, what do we say the wells capturing the plume the contaminated plume would be pretty high or you know uh, remarkably high let us say right. So if you do not place the wells or extraction wells uh, that are pumping out the water at the relevant locations right you risk a chance of uh, what do we say the plume flowing around uh, the relevant uh, flow paths that are captured by the uh, extraction wells as in let us say let us try to illustrate this particular aspect let us say. So here I have this particular plume and this is the plan again right this is the groundwater flow direction. So where do I place this extraction well is it here here or so though. So if I know that the plume is out here let us say I need to then choose number of extraction wells the spacing between the wells and the distance from the what is edge of the plume right and the width that can be captured here. So then the extraction well flow path lines are going to be something like this let us say and then the entire width or the entire plume will be captured. Again, so there is some uh, scientific basis behind this obviously these are aspects that we are going to discuss later on too right. So this is one particular example from the Indian context but uh, data on this particular aspect was uh, relatively limited. So we are going to let us say skip on to or move on to another particular case study where I have or uh, we have rather more data. So the study here uh, in this case is a landfill right uh, in, uh, uh, in the US I believe right and we are going to look at. Uh, uh, try to understand that particular uh, case and see what uh, what is usually done let us see. So let us move on to that particular slide ok so obviously first it is uh, site characterization. So before we go further obviously uh, we need to understand you know what is the site about and so forth. So obviously there are we need to identify residential areas which are affected you know forests and then obviously wetlands I guess right ecologically sensitive areas too right and here we have the relevant site out here yes. So here is the landfill that was typically used both for municipal solid waste and some uh, industrial waste or consumable rather right from a plastics uh, manufacturing and I believe a tire manufacturing company here. So this was the landfill out here ok and we have what do we say I believe in this particular uh, slide the relevant aspect. So we have wetlands here, forests and residential areas in the vicinity.
though it is not uh, densely populated you know they were in relative close proximity to this particular land landfill which was on a uh, which is located on a hilltop I guess right. So, let us look at or try to understand what the uh, system is. So, obviously, it has highway here, we have some streams out here right and again one other one out here. Anyway, uh, I am not going to go into the details at this stage, but we will cover such details during the course of the class though. So, I believe uh, the crux of the issue here is that heavy metals are leaching from this particular landfill which is at a hilltop or on a hill not hilltop let us say a hillock let us say or at a elevated elevation let us say or uh, at a higher elevation pardon me right. And you have leaching of these heavy metals from the landfill into the relevant either ground water or surface water streams and there is a potential obviously for what we say contamination of ground waters that are relied upon by these residential areas or these residents for their drinking water supply right. So, here let us say if this is the scenario and this is the contaminated site. So, the course is going to look at let us say how do I go about it and what are the best alternatives that one can choose now right. So, in this context obviously what needs to be done we need to look at the risk assessment again that is going to be looked at in detail during the course right during the uh, what do we say semester let us say we are going to spend I believe a week or so about it and then we are going to move on to look at let us say uh, two major aspects as I mentioned ground water and uh, what is it now uh, and uh, here we have soils I guess right contaminated soil how do we remediate them and what are the options. So, obviously different uh, options let us say are going to be depend upon what kind of contaminant and what kind of aquifer do we have. For example, let us say heavy metals let us say depending upon the time of type of heavy metal if it is relatively more soluble right you know it is not going to be adsorbed onto the soil let us say or there will be there might be some, but usually you know it is going to be relatively less depending upon the type of heavy metal let us say. But let us say if it is a hydrophobic compound let us say like as hydrocarbon or let us say chlorinated solvent, chlorinated solvents are used as industrial solvents now right. And let us say there is considerable uh, what do we say uh, there are number of contaminated sites uh, mostly in the western uh, world and certainly in Indian context too because the regulations usually are not uh, what do we say uh, strictly enforced here right uh, of these chlorinated solvents and they are uh, carcinogens or toxic compounds. But uh, unlike let us say soluble compounds uh, like some of the heavy metals let us say here the case is that these chlorinated solvents are remarkably hydrophobic right. So, the key here is that you need to be able to understand that any action that would only try to treat the ground water would not you know be uh, uh, satisfactory in this case. So, then you need to look at uh, different techniques let us say could it be soil washing right or natural attenuation or so on and so forth or could it be a passive treatment technique and so on right. So, in general again we are not going to come up with only one alternative we are going to understand the different alternatives and then come up with a set of alternatives that would in general be fe technically feasible right. So, that is something we are, we are going to go into. So, again we are going to briefly go through this particular site uh, in this session and then depending upon the time we are going to again look at this particular site in the next session and then go through the relevant aspects we are going to cover in the class in greater detail. So, from these two sessions I guess uh, or I assume you will have enough information to decide whether this course is of uh, relevance to you or not right. So, let us uh, move on. So, here is the site location you know again as I mentioned it is on a hillock here that is what uh, you know is visible from this particular site. So, here we have a few surface water bodies out here yes again uh, obviously we need to look at uh, ground water uh, models and such. I am not going to go that go to that in detail at this particular point in time, but we will certainly do so during the uh, uh, course of the uh, during during the due course I guess right. So, again uh, let us move on ok. So, here we have what do we say a cross section at a particular location. So, here is the landfill right at some cases we have bedrock which is relatively impermeable let us say right. And as I mentioned at this particular landfill is on a particular uh, hillock right it is at a particular elevation compared to or at a higher elevation compared to its surrounding areas thus exacerbating probably let us say uh, the transport of the relevant contaminants. So, the key issue here was I guess that initially they had no impermeable layer beneath the landfill right. So, why do you need an impermeable layer in the first case? So, obviously again in general you are going to have anaerobic conditions in these particular landfills there is no access to air or oxygen out there right. So, anaerobic conditions so in general anaerobic conditions as we know you know uh, what do we say lead to formation of acids and acids again come in contact with let us say 
uh, you know heavy metals uh, which are uh, which are not which are in solid form let us say and then that will lead to dissolution of the heavy metals and then leaching of the heavy metals right over time. So, the leaching or the leachate comes through right. So, if I have no impermeable layer here, so what is going to happen let us say depending upon the uh, soil characteristics here, it is going to contaminate the ground water right or you know depending upon the elevation it can lead to contamination of the surface water too right and obviously contamination of the soil here. So, that is one particular aspect here that needs to be looked at though. So, in general though we need to have an impermeable layer and above that a leachate collection system and so on. So, again that is something we are going to discuss in the context of landfills in soils and sediments and so on, but uh, for now you know obviously we need to know that uh, we need to have a landfill. So, initially there was no landfill and then looks like a committee was set up and they suggested putting up the landfill, but to my knowledge it, were, it was not successful. Right. Again a different cross section here I guess, again you see the relevance of these bedrocks which are impermeable, but you see that there is considerable areas out there or considerable area out there that is uh, relatively more permeable allowing for uh, the leachate to permeate through the soil. Right. So, again uh, different characteristics as in slope and such, but we are not going to go into that in great detail. So, that is the particular aspect out there. So, uh, now obviously uh, once there was an outcry from the residents or once the regulatory agency detected the contaminants at relatively higher level, what did they do? They obviously need to come up with different monitoring wells, right. So, here they looked at extraction wells, monitoring wells and so on. So, landfill monitoring wells I guess they have these in here they have the extraction wells I mean these were set up later obviously right to extract the leachate that was going through as you see it is they are set up around the periphery of this particular landfill right and obviously you have the performance and compliance monitoring wells. So, once you set up your particular uh, alternative or once you come up with an alternative obviously you cannot sh just shut shop you need to obviously have uh, monitoring wells that are going to look at uh, the performance of your particular chosen alternative over time. So, that is what you see out there. Obviously, the location of these extraction wells depends upon the kind of alternative that they looked at and I guess we are going to look at it in a bit more detail, but the alternative that they chose was pumping out the leachate and treating it at a different water treatment plant right either on site or off site. So, that is something we are going to discuss in greater detail right. So, let us just skip through. So, risk assessment as in I need to know right what is the level of risk posed by this particular contaminated site to either the residents or to the uh, what do we say ecologically sensitive areas out there right. So, let us look at that what are the major steps. So, I need to identify the hazards right as in what are the various chemicals right and how are the chemicals chosen now they are chosen based on either their ability to be toxic or carcinogenic let us say. And we have standard uh, what do we say data for these particular aspects. So, that should be relatively easy. So, obviously, hazard identification is the first step and then exposure assessment as in what are the different routes or pathways and where does the chemical end up as in we discussed a few or you know we are going to highlight a few chemicals here from this hazard identification. So, then uh, we need to look at what are the different pathways as in is it ground water that is leading to transport of the contaminant to the relevant or the affected or sensitive areas or is it let us say uh, through the air or through uh, soil or so on right and obviously what is the fate out there. So, moving on then we are need to call calculate the toxicity right. Again we have the standard toxicological data for these chemicals and that is something that we are going to look at again. So, these are typically developed from dose as in for a dose of this particular compound what is the adverse response right. That is how this toxicological data is calculated in general out there. So, how do you define a particular compound to be uh, toxic or not now right. So, you are going to conduct the tests on uh, in general uh, rats or mice right and then you are going to try to extrapolate their uh, that data to humans right. So, there are different ways, but in general obviously uh, the crux of the issue is that you are going to expose the relevant uh, laboratory animal to uh, higher concentrations of that compound look at the adverse response as in let us say could it be tumor, carcinogenic tumor, hair fall, lesions on the skin so on and so forth and going to come up with a dose response curve let us say right depending upon the type of compound dose and response let us say and from that you are going to come up with 
toxicological data right. So, obviously, you know we have relevant data for most almost all the compounds, but we need to know the relevant background to understand the uncertainties involved let us say when we are conducting the risk assessment right. So, moving on this is the major aspect here risk characterization as in I need to put a number for the risk that it that uh, you know that is posed to the relevant uh, what do we say affected areas due to different pathways let us say right. So, we are going to have to estimate the incidence of adverse health or you know adverse effects right and obviously put a number as in I can, can't just say you know it's high or low because it's subject to right. So obviously, if I say okay, risk due to what do we say uh, exposure uh, to drinking water at the usual levels is around let's say two. I'm talking about let's say here uh, for uh, non-carcinogens or toxic compounds let's say right, which is the hazard index I guess right is two. Is two. Usually the cutoff we look at our threshold is one I guess right, and let's say for from some other pathway it's uh, 0 0.001. So, that will help me understand let us say uh, you know for example, if let us say from taking in ground water the hazard index comes out to be 2 and from ingestion of uh, what we say are coming in contact with soil right the uh, hazard index that is calculated or you know the risk characterization comes out to be let us say 0 0.01 let us say and you, the threshold obviously is was hazard index is daily intake of the relevant compound by acceptable daily intake or reference dose. Anyway, we are going to look at these aspects in greater detail later on. So, let us say from here I can clearly see right or not see pardon me understand that uh, what do we say ingestion of uh, drinking of the ground water process a much greater risk than coming in contact with soil. So, let us say depending upon the resources that I have I am going to put in more resources towards remediating the contaminated ground water right. So, I guess I am out of time for this uh, session. So, we will continue looking at this particular site in the next session right and then we will look at the topic specifically that we are going to uh, let us say discuss in great detail throughout the course uh, you know we are going to skim through that. And uh, you know uh, I guess with that I am going to end uh, today's session and hopefully I will see most of you uh, back for the next session and thank you.